Hey guys, still here and welcome back to Red Dragon. It's 10v10 tactical on mud fight. I am not sure how many times I've uttered those words by now, but I think it'll be around 100 videos just focusing on this map and this game type. Now there seems to be a curious trend happening lately, and that is that people are asking me not to focus on their own gameplay. I find this very interesting. Um, it's happened a few times in the last week slash weeks that people say, hey, I got a really good replay, but don't look at me, look at this guy. He's the real star of the show. And in this case, the gameplay was sent in by JackerHay1990. You can see him up here, number three on the list. He says, nope, don't look at me, look at Swift Killer." So that's what we're going to do. And I already um, browsed through the replay, it is a good one. Swift Killer is going to be using an armor deck specifically an Israeli armored deck and he's going to be handling a combination of a tank with a mortar for smoke support very very nicely uh, it's something that I usually don't do I just I don't know I covered a ton of these replays already and I just keep forgetting to do it but he definitely does it very very well so let's have a look and meanwhile um, most of the enemy team seems to be going to alpha we have all sorts of units getting ready to go left, including a Leclerc by Tadaka. Uh, quad stacks of very high veterancy, also known as elite units, from Freddy. That's one player, two players, three, four. Mm -mm. Four players to Alpha can work, but you really need to get some more units in, especially to the right. We also have an Atacams, which I think is too far to the front, actually. But I'm not too sure about that. I'm not really sure what his plan is. Two times Patriots by Blaze Pilot, so that's another player accounted for. An Atacams spending uh, is another player. And that leaves Swift Killer to pretty much fend for himself. He goes in with a couple of ram wreckies with infantry inside, of course, Merc of a 3D Baz and a Shinaf 2. And that's all that we have for the first moment. Now I'm really interested to see what this Atacams is going to be doing. It fires one. What can you possibly hope to hit? An Atacams is, I'd say, the very definition of a sniper. What? Whoa! Holy shit. <laughs> okay. My bad. Good shot by Koke. He fired. Probably he's done this before and he estimated, well, if the enemy starts out from here, by the time that my missile gets there, it should be about here. Uh, this is where I need to be going with my missile in order to intercept enemy forces. And he's right. He gets rewarded with a command vehicle kill. So that's a good start for him. Leaves nine command vehicles on the enemy team. That should still be plenty to capture a couple of sectors. Anyway, we have the super heavy over here from uh, Swift Killer. He's also bringing his own command. But aside from that, he is utterly alone. Yes, he might get some help from the Nighthawk operated by the... Uh, <laughs> the Nighthawk operated by the Wu-Tang Clan. And the uh, guy over here, Meow, is apparently flying air support with two block 15, or block uh, 52s. So, let's see if we can find something over here. Bedouins, Remrecki. Remrecki, good optics, medium stealth. These guys, very good optics, very good stealth. So these are more likely to take the front line and these are more likely to be relocated to a side line over here. Same over here. Um, unfortunately, they are already being detected by what must be enemy reconnaissance forces, otherwise they would definitely be in cover. So we just have to see what other threats are out here before the Merkava can commit. You can see that he has disabled the Lahat. He's not going for a long-range missile kill, and that Lahat with 22 AP can really make a, a fairly big dent in enemy armor. He kills off a transport, that was the Tatra. Infantry escapes just before the enemy vehicle detonated. That Tatra blew up. A Vihor gets detected, pushes in. The Merkava immediately reverses out of there. And look at this. 
the Vihor already has smoke cover. Potentially by Yukikaze himself, but it might be from another player who he's communicating with. Unfortunately for Swiftkiller, he does not yet have such support. He does not have any smoke screen, so he's going to have to rely on the natural cover, the tree lines, the terrain. Or, um, if he gets really lucky, either a player on his team that might be helping him out, or enemy player who repositions his smoke screen or puts it down poorly. And he immediately says, I'm going to need help here. He's reading the situation, he's reading the map, and he goes, nope, this is not going to go well. Now the Patriots are still moving into position, both firing, and that scratches one Syria. You might want to relocate from there, and that's exactly what he's doing. Well done, Blaze Pilot. All right, we know that there is a Vihor and a Praka, so sending in an anti-tank plane over here is not really recommended. Even if the Praka would miss, the line of sight is so unreliable over here on the Vihor that you might as well not send it in. By the time that your plane gets there, there's a very good chance that the smoke screen has obstructed view to the tank and that you're just going to miss. And then the Praka can still kill you. So, too much risk, too low reward. Now he is sending in a couple of reservists over here. These guys are not really good for anything other than uh, occupying buildings or being a sort of recon force. But even that they suck at because their optics is only medium. Jacker Hay is saying, hey, fall back. You're going to get outnumbered over here. So far, the Merkava is doing a little bit of damage. But emphasis on the little bit. Because he's just scoring 5-point kills on transports. The Vihor is getting rather annoyed with that. And it starts to push forward. Thanks to the smoke screen, though, the Lahat fired by um, the Merkava 3 misses. Prowler flies in from Jacker Hay. The um, Praka was turned off. The Prowler turns around and gets evac That's when the Praka goes live. And interestingly, Jacker Hay sends in an Aardvark. I really don't see these units very often, with the exception of campaigns. But these things, if you're unfamiliar with them, they drop 12 cluster munitions, doing 6 AP each. Or, well, the bomblets do 6 AP. So the bombs are in the air, here they come, and that Vihor is going to be in a world of hurt. Jacker Hay gets 310 points, or at least he's at 310. So there's a very good chance that the Vihor is actually dead. And there we go, dead super heavy. Another thing that I really like to see, and I just keep hammering away at this every episode I do, markers like these are so important. If he would not have put that down, then Swift Killer would have only seen that an enemy tank might have been struck by anti-air or by um, an aircraft. But you don't really know if you're actually dealing with a dead super heavy or if it's retreating. So he says dead super heavy and he goes, thank you, that's awesome. Now I can have a little bit more operational freedom over here. Bedouins moving up slightly, weapons off. They don't want to give their position away because with that M14 they will start to fire at the uh, Zalosnici. Unfortunately for the Zalosnici they have a bigger gun firing back at them. It's the Merkava 3 with the MG151 that does 3 HE per shot. I still think that's a little low. I'm not really sure why exactly Eugen decided that you need 125 to get 4 HE. But sure, we'll just have to go with it. At any rate, you can bet your ass that Red 4 definitely knows that there is a Merc of a 3 over here. And they can probably exactly tell you where on the map it is. Because it keeps popping in and out from over here. And he does not really have a lot of other terrain features that he can use. Bedouins encounter another recon squad. And these guys are firing back with their sniper rifle. So at this point, it becomes a sniper match. But again, the snipers get back up from a far bigger gun. The question is, who can do the most damage in the shortest period of time? And at the moment, it seems like the Prus are not really too confident about the situation. They try to keep firing, and so did the Bedouins. Three, they're stunned. Come on, one more round from the Merc. He's pushing up quite a bit here, and this is risky. He gets caught out in the open, there we go. 
and an anti-tank plane comes in, then it's going to be a pretty long drive back to that tree line. So far, he seems fine, though. The Remreki was surprisingly uncountered as it made it all the way over here. Now, this thing is only armed with a Browning, so any infantry squad with an AT weapon worth a damn is going to move up to it and kill it immediately. So, Blaze Pilot says, okay, let's push to here. Um, he, however, does not have any supporting units short of the Patriots. But the Patriots, in this case, could be exactly what Swift Killer needs. Because he needs to be sure that enemy airplanes are going to be heavily dissuaded from making a move on his Merkava. And even if they do make a play, then the Patriots are likely to shut it down. The question is, can they shut down an enemy AT plane before the AT plane kills the Merkava? Because if the Merkava goes down over here, that's when the shit is really going to start for Blue, because they have nothing else that can hold up this flank. Here comes a plane that's probably far outside of the Patriot range. Let's see how the Alpha battle is going. Holy crap, 40 Canadian Airborne and, f well, what's left of 40 Pathfinders, 32 currently. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Something about quad stacking your units. I'm not going to go into that in this video. I just, I feel like a broken record at that point. You don't quad stack your units, and if you do, then you're asking for shit like that. Now... Unfortunately, his ram Reki got destroyed by the cluster munitions. The Merkava took a little bit of a hit, but is otherwise fine. But it does need supplies, because it's down to its last eight rounds of ammunition. It still has two of the four missiles. But I wouldn't be too confident about that. I want to be a little bit more comfortable with main ammo as well as fuel. Because if I'm caught out in the open and my fuel is out, well, that's when I'm really going to lose that tank. Or at least, one Swift Killer is going to lose his tank. At this point, he does have a Laish. And with that, he can put up his own smoke screens if and when, and especially where, he needs them. And you're going to see quite a bit of that happening. Now, Spetsnaz VMF get deployed by a K-29. The Rangers have a first-line look at an enemy or a friendly transport, I think, being killed off. They can still see the Spetsnaz, but I don't think the Spetsnaz or that the Rangers are really tempted to fire at the Spatsnaz and give their position away. If they do, then that big angry helicopter is going to come back and shoot them. So, a little bit of a breather here. They're moving up a few more infantry units. Rovait, Bedouin's far on the right, but it's one guy. He goes down and he loses pretty much the entire right flank for vision. Merkava fires and immediately proceeds to kill off the Spatsnaz VMF. It's good that he did, because finding those guys again is not easy. Shinav gets into range of the MI2, misses his first shot, tries to reload, fires again, shot goes wide, fires a third, and misses that as well. These things are so freaking useful. Alright, so, do we have reinforcements coming in? Kim Jong-un surrenders. There we go. That's the newest headline. <laughs> Good thing. North Korea is safer already. Well, especially South Korea too, I suppose. Well, Aish gets a little bit of damage in on the BTR-70, or re at least tries to. Oh, this could be a good kill for the Patriot. Yep, somebody else got him. Two Tomcats. Okay, this is not good. I mean, I don't dislike two Tomcats. But I also saw another player with two Falcon Block 52s, or F-16 Block 52s. So that's two players going air. It's basically three players going into air, because Blaze Pilot's operating his two Patriots. So that's three players covering the aerial section of the game. What about the ground? Because we only have a couple of infantry units left over here. Over here we still have the Leclerc. A little bit of reconnaissance, but very little in the sense of AA. But then again, you don't need that if you have these and the Block 52s. The right flank seems to be alright, but he is quite hesitant about pushing up without more AA. And you can see that the MI2RO is getting increasingly confident that he can just operate here, spot everything, and not get shot at. He can probably even see the Patriots moving around. And the Patriots, too, can just blankly stare back at the MI2RO because they cannot actually damage it. 
they don't have any uh, anti-helicopter missiles. So, for the moment, he's just stuck here. And if Red 4 gets a hint that this area is maybe not as AA-proof or helicopter-proof as they think it is. Yep, and he's got no fuel. Then they might start to push in with a little bit more helicopter assets. Now, fortunately, Jacker Hay, as a good support player, brings in a Hemet. It's going to take him a while to get there. So, he's got no fuel, and he says, nope, fuel's on its way, don't worry. These, again, are important. Because by sending a marker like this, Swift Killer knows that he doesn't have to get his own fuel. He can focus instead on bringing more offensive units. Now, he's trying to get into cover, but that MI2RO just keeps lighting him up. And there's not really anywhere to go. At this point, they don't really have too much left in the sense of combat units. We have two Bedouins, which, thanks to the grace of their very good stealth, are still being undetected. The Rovait cannot say the same thing. The Zelda, quite easy to detect. And the Murkov is just sitting there. Now, he does have his own recon or resupply units on the way. He's going to need repairs, rearmed, and especially resupplied by fuel, because he's now done 149 points. This is when we see a K-29, an MI-24D, and an MI-2RO coming in. So much for the infantry. Merkava 3 again moves immediately into the woods, making sure it does not get detected. The Rios are resupplying, repairing, and uh, refueling the tank. The question is, are they detected? There goes the Remreki on the right flank. There goes the Recon on the right flank. So far, it's just not really a gunship, but a KA-29TB that goes uncountered can still really mess you up, and that's exactly what he does. He fires blindly into the tree line, almost taking out a command squad over here from Blaze Pilot. Zelda gets detected, the Hammett finally arrives, and is immediately greeted with a salvo of rocket pods. Or, well, not a salvo of rocket pods. Who would throw a rocket pod at an enemy? He's greeted with a salvo of rockets, and as such, I think that the K-29 might be approaching empty. Jacker Hayes recommending that Blaze Pilot, sorry, that Swift Killer pulls back. Because at the moment there is very little that can guarantee the safety of the Merkava 3. He is pushing forward, or at least trying to create a diversion maybe, with the Zelda and the Bedouins. Creating just enough of a smoke wall to make sure that the Merkava can sort of make it safely back. And just look at what he's doing. He's building a sort of a smoke wall slash smoke bridge. This way the Merkava has a little bit more freedom of maneuverability. And can operate slightly more freely. Because this tree line is really not that good. Around here... Is what? Is what? A mortar? Yeah, they definitely know that there's infantry in there. They might even know that it's a command infantry unit. Merkava pushes forward. Now this is what I wanted to highlight. He fires off a couple of rounds and immediately withdraws into the safety of his own smokescreen. And the enemy loses line of sight. That smokescreen is currently keeping this Merkava 3 alive. Jacker Hay comes in with another Aardvark, potentially the same thing. Uh, bombing run. I'm not sure if he killed it. Maybe we can see another marker going up. Now, interestingly, Swift Killer is the one, I'd say, is the one operating and holding this flank on his own. But he's only scored 110 points. Jacker Hay for, scored 470. And. That's partially due to taking down the uh, Vihor early on in the game. Again, more smoke goes up. The smoke is oriented in a sort of a line over here. So the Merc can push out, get a couple of rounds in, do some damage. Again, score a couple of low value kills. Push out, push back into the smoke screen. HGMs need line of sight, unless they're fire and forgets. But there really aren't too many fire and forget missiles in the game. At this point, the smoke screen starts to fade. So once again, the Laish puts up a couple more smoke rounds. 
and safely guides the Merc of the 3D back into the cover of the tree line. Now he does not have a lot of spotting left. There's just one set of Bedouins and a couple of Rangers. But that's about it. In the meanwhile, these Rangers are at the risk of being detected by the Speciality. So the Merkava moves to intercept. This thing is going to need quite a few rounds to actually kill them. And there is more trouble on its way. There's another Vihor. The Vihor gets hit, fires back at the Merkava. Now, the Merkava, 22 frontal armor, 23 AP. The Vihor, 18 frontal armor, 20 AP. If the Merkava stays at maximum range, and the Vihor does too, then these guys are not equally matched. The Vihor does not damage the Merkava at maximum range. Whereas the Merkava at maximum range definitely makes a hell of a dent into the Vihor, and that's exactly what you see happening here. Currently, the Vihor is in range where it can damage the Merkava, and it does so. But the Merkava does even more damage to the Vihor. He's down to one hit point, and that's when he loses line of sight, unfortunately. So he pushes out, trying to get one more shot in on the Vihor. Unfortunately, we can't see it anymore. So he decides that it is not worth the risk. Angles his armor just in time as that HGM comes in. If that would have hit the side, that would have done a hell of a lot more damage. Careful, says Blaze Pilot. You might overextend. Pulls back. Laish is still standing by. He still has his Rios ready, so he can still resupply his tank and repair it. Because a half health super heavy is still a heck of a threat for the enemy, but it is much more difficult and dangerous to safely operate it over here. It's dangerous to safely operate it. Yeah, right. It is much more dangerous to operate a half health tank like this. Now on the left, let's have a quick look. Pathfinders, Bison... See, I don't really know what they're up against, so I cannot really comment on exactly what they have over here. It seems that Red is again operating helicopters without really being punished for it. Uh-oh. b tier 70s. We're gonna lose this fight. Those Rangers are dead. Leclerc might be able to help out a little bit, but it wouldn't hold my breath. Fix, please. Says Blaze Pilot. I'm not exactly sure what he wants to fix. The Chaparral? Ooh, that missile came in close from MI-24 Whiskey. Chaparral fires again, kills off the gunship. You better get this thing into cover because it is about to run out of fuel. Ooh, cluster munitions come in. Nice, says Swift Killer. Thank you very much. They're being clustered. The Merkava might just make it out alive. Oh, he's down to one hit point. Hammett rushes in. The Chaparral, by some miracle, did not actually take any damage from the cluster munition. Again, the Merkava is moving towards cover, but the enemy definitely knows where it is. So, while it is still a threat, it's at least a threat with a location marker on it, because they know where it is. Again, artillery comes in. And while they were angling to get a shot at the Chaparral, because this is probably the last known firing position for the Chaparral, they are also firing at the TACOM. Unfortunately, that shot took out the Hemet, the resupply unit. The Baz... Actually, was that a Hemet? Yeah, that was a Hemet. The Baz is not getting repaired. The Chaparral dies. The... Uh, where's the Rios? Oh, the Rios are being resupplied over here at the FOB. This is a problem. Koki left the game. I'm not exactly sure why. Because he still has his Flak Panzer. Or sorry, his uh, Atacams. Scored only 115 points. So after killing off that 1CV, he hasn't really done that much. Two KA-29s coming in. And there's nothing that can stop them. The Patriots are running the hell away. There's a Merida coming in, which for a Merkava usually is not a threat. But the Merkava has something else to worry about. Rocket pods coming from the KA-29. Their Patriots are now also under attack. There goes one Patriot. The other Patriots heavily damaged. There goes the second Patriot. 
And there goes the Super Heavy. That's the end of the Merkava. So, while the Laish desperately tries to provide some sort of cover for the Merkava, unfortunately the Merkava is dead. Smokescreen came too late, and now the Laish is dead too. And, oh shit, Foxtrot is now wide open. We have a uh, whole defensive force of one unit of Hapak with an Uzi and a Follow, and one Bardellas with a whole bunch of machine guns and a little bit of armor on it. Swift Killer decides that he is not going to sit around over here and wait for that to happen. So he puts up a ton of help markers, or sorry, that's Tataka, packs up his commander unit and rushes it away. He is not going to sit around and wait for this to happen. Now keep in mind that all of this happened thanks to two KA-29s. It's not like you're dealing with an MI-28, it's not an Akula, it is just a transport helicopter armed with a couple of autocannons as well as a whole bunch of rocket pods. And it was enough. Of course that uh, Merkava got heavily damaged initially by the blast from the cluster munitions, but later on um, when it was so heavily damaged, it was easy pickings for the rocket pods. So the rockets took it out, and they are seemingly also looking to take out the Leclerc. So far it's still alive. But the question is, how long is that going to be that way? Because for now it can sort of still defend its sides. But this side is now wide open. <laughs> Vate uh, comes in. Activates the A9Ls, tries to get shots in on the helos. I have seen a surprising lack of enemy airplanes, by the way. Tomcat tries it. Unfortunately, a Tomcat is very bad at turning around. Turning raise is 400. So it's going to take these guys quite a bit of time to actually turn around and try to get shots on the helo. In the meanwhile, Swiftkiller deployed a Machbet to defend against those oncoming helicopters. He's not the only one, because Blaze Pilot put up a Stinger, Jacker Hay brought an MBT-70, and if we could get some infantry in here, that would be very helpful as well. And as he's correctly pointing out, we need some recon. We don't know what's going on. Blaze Pilot brings in a Humvee with Riflemen. And over on the left, the situation isn't much better. Uh, we have exactly one Pathfinder over here. A Hatchin and Shiki. One Black Hawk to defend against, or well, serve as a picket line, not really defend this line against helicopters. CV moving into a position somewhere deep, deep inside the woods. Navy SEALs, again, deep inside the woods. And Red has captured Charlie, Delta, Alpha, and is probably well on its way to actually capturing Foxtrot as well. That would be a T-55. Now, they're giving them a little bit of a breather. Blaze Pilot spots a Super Heavy. And again, Red 4 is also very much on point with his smoke screens. This is a dangerous area to traverse with a Super Heavy. So he puts up a little bit of smoke, and now the Super Heavy can very easily and gracefully move from one tree line to the next. And from over here, it can actually move quite close to these buildings over here, and very much threaten the security of this cap. It seems, though, that Vate the guy operating the Tomcats, has saved up quite a lot of points and buys an M1A2 Abrams. That should keep any Super Heavy at range, if they can spot for it. At the moment, there is no such capability. You might argue, well, they don't really need it, because at the moment, the Super Heavies or enemy targets are close enough that you don't really need to see them, or that you don't really need a spotter. The Stingers are moving dangerously close Ah, there's the CV. Dangerously close to the M24D. Uh, BRDM has them in sight. Fortunately, he decided to go for something else. And the Stinger survived. Apparently, Yabish over here did not wreck it. There we go. That was the T55. He did not realize the threat to his M24D, so he just capped it over there. Or he was baiting. Maybe he was trying to bait them into coming any closer, so the T55 could take him out. But I... Not sure about that. So, blue was sitting on 34.75 points, red on 28.10. This makes for an interesting situation. 
Because we have nine minutes left. If blue can survive for another nine minutes, they'll win the game. If red wants to win, they're going to have to push. But they don't exactly know what's out there. And pushing in is going to be quite risky. Because you don't know what's in there. And it's urban terrain, which is generally harder to push through. Besides that, the enemy has the Abrams and the Leclerc. That's the Leclerc that came in from over there. Both defending this area. However, that does not guarantee safety of this sector. Because if the enemy deploys, for example, VDV-90, and the Leclerc or the Abrams get too close, then they're going to get heavily punished by the VDV. And with the exception of this one Machbet from Swiftkiller, there is still not too much in the sense of anti-helicopter warfare. The Machbet does go after the M24 Delta, takes a little bit of damage on him, or does a little bit of damage to him, and there we go, takes him out. That's one helo less. 36.25, 29.25, there's 700 ahead, 8.5 minutes left. The left flank... Well, might as well not be there, because at the moment, these guys are not really any sort of combat-worthy force. And besides, with all the enemy sectors under Red 4 Command, Blue is almost entirely deprived of income. They just cannot buy any new units, so whatever they have is going to have to do. Anything that gets killed is going to be hard to replace, so with that, they need to be really, really careful on what they bring out and where. Because if you call in the wrong unit and it gets killed off, well, good luck replacing it. And especially working in tandem with other players over here gets more and more important. Unfortunately, the Machbet get killed off. Again with the KA-29s. Unsurprisingly, these guys are elite by now. They rush in. Undefended sectors like these can get massacred by K-29s. And, oh, if the enemy fires cluster at this point, it's going to be very fun. But the Akula has more fun. Kills off the Leclerc. And is very much on his way to also killing off the Abrams. One more hit should do it. The question is who's going to get it. And it is the Akula. So the Akula... K-29s, even a VHOR pushing in. There is another M24 VP bucking him up. The whole damn sector is dead. Echo is just gone. And thanks to killing off all of those units, Red is now th sitting at 38.75. Blue is still sort of able to bring in reinforcements. I mean, they have the sector, but do they have the points? One javelin gets spawned in. But this deep inside the tree line, it is not capable of actually doing anything. But fortunately for them, the helos just come to them. The Akula is trying to get a shot off on the uh, Hachi Nanashiki. Sorry, the Nanion Shiki. But it doesn't really do much. What the hell? What's that Nighthawk doing? He drops. Where are those gonna go? fuck was that? I mean, sure, the uh, Akula is dead. But I'm not sure if that was the actual target. Now, there is one thing that I haven't actually been covering. And that's this. We have one Hachi Nanashiki. It was well on its way <laughs> into Red Force Command Sector. And although they are out of fuel, they can still do a bit of damage. And that Smirch, which has been massacring enemy tanks left, right and center might get killed off. Vate surrenders, so that's the Tomcats being transferred to what I think is Tataka. The Hachin and Nishiki massacres the BTR-40, kills off the Smirch. It's going to be a race to see who can kill the CVs quickest. We have five minutes left. 4200 for blue, so blue is actually leading again. Hachin and Nishiki rushes in. If he can capture the fob, he can resupply. There we go. You could also use a bit of repair. But sitting over here is a bit risky. Because you're sitting inside a resupply zone. Or a spawn zone. Echo 
is still under blue for control, but only because there is one officer left alive in the Hapak squad. That's all. And that's not going to stay that way for much longer. So they lose Echo. In the meanwhile, the Hachi Nanashiki has been resupplied. It's been repaired a little bit, but of course now Red 4 brings in new units. Another BTR-40, which again gets killed by a Hachi Nanashiki. He tries it again, gets killed again. But the Hachi Nanashiki does take some damage. It cannot keep up like that. That would be the Artvark again. Doing damage to some units. And that seems to have been a BTR-90 times 2. So Jacker Hay got a couple more points. There's one more CV rushing away here, and that's Freddy, with his uh, 50, 151 CP. Red just randomly bombs stuff, because they're getting quite desperate. They only have 4 minutes left, and they are still 200 points behind, almost 300. So, can we keep the CV safe for long enough? The Hachin and Nishiki is rushing away at best speed, but it cannot outrun a gunship. The gunship knows it, the Hachin and Shiki knows it. It does try to return fire, but the MR24 VP just says nope. <laughs> Tedeka says go boy go, but unfortunately it's not enough. 42.95, 41.25, three and a half minutes left. Blue still has a significant presence over here. A PIP-3, uh, sorry, PIP-3, Pathfinders, Canadian Airborne, Cargos. And now Red starts to just, well, I'm not sure if it's random, but they definitely start to bomb stuff. Irao tries to take a shot, does not get the shot off because it's stunned. Gets evac ordered, and the uh, PIP-3 is going to need supplies from the Cargo. Three minutes left. Another Orao comes in, again from Yukikaze. This time around, he does get the drop on the Hawk, and the Hawk dies. That's the entire AA defense that this group had left dead. Damn. <laughs> pull back. Well, pull back where is the big question. Where do you have to go? Freddy, in the meanwhile, or should I say Larson, because that's the name of the unit, is doing some sightseeing and taking his command vehicle off-roading. We have two minutes left. Can you keep a CV safe in the back of these woods for two minutes? And even if you do, can you get a win out of it? Because I don't think it's going to be a win. Red 4 is too close, so even if they get them, it's going to be a draw. At this point, a Salamandra spots the 151 and misses its first Kokon. And does not miss its second. 90 seconds left. There's one CV that I had purposely ignored. And that's the Iltis over here. Probably some of you already spotted that. But I wanted to keep you guys... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to keep the game a little tense like that. So the Iltis. Much faster at off-roading than its uh, CP brother. Is again trying to get as deep into this forest as possible. But as the more observant of you have probably already noticed... There is a few seconds less left on this clock than there is on this, and that has entirely to do with the Salamandra. The Navy SEALs making a last stand, trying to do as much damage to the Salamandra as possible. And they get it. But not the second helicopter. And that's how Blue narrowly, narrowly loses that game. Minor defeat. But if it had been a couple more seconds, like 50 seconds, then it would possibly have been a draw. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this game. Um, I thought it was a good example of how to use super heavies and smoke. Those things worked really, really well together. And it's definitely something I need to be paying more attention to. And maybe you do too, I don't know. If you have a similar replay like this that you think I should have a look at, then by all means send it in through the link down below in the description. Um, note though, the more elaborate or the more interesting your description of the replay is, the more likely I am to feature it. If I just get a description which says, hey, you really need to feature this game, um, 
because it was good, then I go, right, why would I pick that one over 10 other replays that actually have a good description? So make it interesting. Make it catch my eye in one way or another. And I'll leave it up to you exactly how you do that. With that, we've reached the end. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you soon for more videos.